Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Willa Selden, Chief Executive Officer of the Glide Foundation. Willa joined the Glide Foundation in 2007, having previously served as Executive Director of the Tides Center. She previously established one of the first women-focused venture capital funds, served in various executive and leadership posts at AirTouch Communications, William Sonoma, and Solomon Brothers, and continues to serve on the Board of Trustees of Bryn Mawr College and on the Board of Directors of Northern California Public Broadcasting. Glide has served the poor and disenfranchised for over 45 years and has been at the forefront of anti-poverty and other battles. Willa has generously agreed to share some of her insight with us. And I'd like to thank you, Willa, for joining us today. It's a pleasure, thank you. So, you have had quite an amazing career and quite a trajectory. You graduated from Bryn Mawr, you got an MBA from Harvard, you got a JD from, from Yale. You started in, in Solomon Brothers, um, a, an investment bank. And how do you get from, from that background and Solomon Brothers now to Glide? It's a dramatic change. Uh, so in terms of my career, I've really wanted, I've, I've had different phases in my career where I've made choices to do some things I felt were important. Um, I had a phase of my career that was really focused on my corporate life and building a corporate resume, as it were, and having the experience of doing work, work nationally and internationally in that venue. Really fascinating and wonderful work. Um, and at some point in my career, I also wanted to do something entrepreneurial. So I had the chance to also do the entrepreneurial piece of the things that were meaningful to me, to really have the chance to um, see if I could do it on my own and see what it would take to actually make something happen independent of a large organization. And then at that point, I really made the decision that I wanted to have every part of my day be something that mattered and that would actually make the world a better place. Uh, that it wasn't 10% of my time or 5% of profit or, or a charitable gift, uh, but it was something that I could feel good about when I went home every day that I had accomplished something that actually made the world a better place. And that led me to move into the nonprofit sector. And, uh, and then from there, I began to also think about what I wanted as a part of that work uh, once I was introduced to the nonprofit sector and did find myself at Glide. And uh, I found myself at Glide for a number of reasons. Uh, one, the focus of the organization uh, in terms of its work in the community, its presence in the community, and its values in terms of how it does its work, uh, the chance to work with two extraordinary founders, um, and also the chance to bring together multiple strands of my life in a way that could be integrated in one environment. So let's talk about those strands of your life. When you make a decision, as, as many of us have, to go to graduate school, mm -hmm. and you make a decision to earn your MBA, and then in, in your case, you decide to go one better and, and uh, get a JD, you've got this very interesting combination now, and, and from amazing schools. You, you've, you're motivated in a certain direction. Is it, is it self-development? Is it motivated as a foundation for your next step? What, what is your motivation as you're, as you're developing as a, as a young person, uh, your, your, your background, and preparing yourself for some sort of contribution? I've, I've actually not had a career where I've basically looked and said, for me to get to be here, then I have to do this, and I need to do this, and I need to do this. I've not actually led my career in that way, which might surprise you. Uh, I've really more led my career from the standpoint of the things that really were interesting to me at that moment, uh, that were calling me to do something that would challenge me in new ways and allow me to bring my, my skills and my interests forward. So career is a meditation of, uh, in, in, as an exploration of self? In a sense. Uh, it's an exploration of self in a sense. Um, I would say I've used my career to kind of get to the point where I can be my best self. Maybe that's a better way to put that. It's not such an inward, meditation sounds like it's an inward right. process. And instead it's really more of how can I express all the different parts of myself. And in one environment you express in a corporation a particular part of who you are. Um, and in a nonprofit setting, you can express something that's much broader than that. 
Uh, I certainly didn't choose to do that early in my career. I really had a wonderful corporate career. I really loved my corporate career. I wouldn't have changed that for anything. At the same time, I've reached a point in my life where I wanted to have more breadth in terms of the things I was influencing and also the ways I was growing. And what way is, is, is a nonprofit career uh, broader? You, you had said that, that you wanted to express things that you couldn't uh, express in your corporate career. And you did use the term broader. Yes, I did. Um, they're different, I would say, for example, and, and maybe Glide is even that much more different as an organization than a typical nonprofit. I, I think part of what we uh, do very much so at Glide is we really focus on the individual, and we do that with our clients, and we do it with our staff, and we do it with our volunteers, and basically the people that connect from the congregation, et cetera. So all of Glide really starts at that place of saying, let's focus at the person. And so for me, actually in leading an organization that starts from that place, it means I also have to start it myself. Um, and so uh, in terms of that, in this environment in particular, it calls on me to express uh, myself in a broader way than would, be, um, that that would work and some corporate settings. Um, I, I do believe corporations are changing. I think corporations are different today, and I think that startups are different than big companies, and there are all those different types of environments. But at the end of the day, uh, you're there to basically make your profit um, and to do that in a way that's as efficient as possible. Obviously, some corporations also add to that a broader mission, but at the end of the day, you've still got to do those two things. Uh, which means you don't really have the, the time to allow people to come forward with their full selves because the organization can't hold that and really give it the time to develop. Is the distinction that a corporation can't really afford in this environment that is so financially driven to, be, to behave as if it's a community, as if it, as if it, as if it cares about things other than uh, quarterly profit? No, I wouldn't say that. I think that corporations have to care about something other than quarterly profit. They have to. They have to be connected to the community. So in this, uh, we're talking about degrees and also intent. So, for example, a corporation, I think, to be successful today has got to walk the walk of both caring about bottom line, caring about stockholders, um, caring about Wall Street, et cetera, at the same time corporations also have to also care about community. You have to do both of those things. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you've got to take care of the profit piece and you've got to take care of the efficiency piece and all of those things to work together. And this has to be smaller than in a nonprofit, just by nature of the work. And, and I've seen actually Glide um, engage uh, corporations in, yes. in your activities. Could you describe a little bit about how you interact with, uh, with corporations as a nonprofit? Yes, I think it's, it depends on the company. So, um, you know, certainly for some companies, they want a deep engagement with us. They want to volunteer. They want to make donations. They want to really be connected with our clients. And others, uh, they want to connect just at the point of bringing some volunteers periodically. Uh, so I, I think I've seen a, a variation in that. Um, we have wonderful corporate partners that have been extraordinarily generous that really do this because they see all the aspects of how to meld community and how to bring volunteerism to their work and to engage their employees and also how to um, have that be something that works for um, their organization's overall success as well as their contribution to community. And I think there's some corporations that have really kind of figured out that common formula, and we've become kind of the core partner to that work being executed. I've talked with some of your volunteer coordinators and heard about uh, how some corporations use the experience with Glide as a way to train their, their, uh, their people and to uh, try and evolve some of the internal dialogue um, around uh, community, around uh, the obligation to the community, and around working together. In particular, um, I, was I was talking with somebody about um, a, a group of, of uh, volunteers from a, a high-tech corporation that had, that had come in to serve meals um, and is, is doing that on a, on a very regular basis as a way to, to, um, 
to have a discussion internally mm -hmm. about how people behave toward each other within that corporation. Well, it's interesting. I think that's I think that's very interesting, Mark. I was um, talking with someone recently. He works for a venture capital firm, and he came to volunteer. And he was he was saying what an incredible experience he'd had. And I said, Well, what was it about that experience? And he said, When I first got to the building, I was really really uncomfortable, and I just thought I don't belong here. And by the time I left in the, the day, I had a completely different <coughs> feeling. And it's, Glide is a place that y you can't go into the place without being challenged, moved, pushed in some way. And I think oftentimes when we work in uh, a corporate environment or when people work in a corporate environment, um, you know, they pretty much have their day kind of planned out. And you can pretty much have a day that <clears throat> you walk into a nice building, you sit in your office, you go to meetings, and that's basically your day. You know, at Glide, I walk into the building. I have never, I have no idea what's going to happen that day when I walk in. I might have an ambulance out in front of the building. There might be fire trucks there. There might be clients that are, you know, stretched out. There might be someone that's, you know, that's yelling. Uh, you know, it's it's a completely random experience about what's going to happen. Not quite like walking into Air Touch Communications and. No, and so um, when you greet those experiences that are unfamiliar it has to cause something to go, wow, what's that about? And I'm, I'm getting changed in some way. I'm getting challenged in some way. And how do I respond to that? And you know, when, when many people walk into a building, um, you, know, you may have a homeless person near there or someone that's asked you for money. And basically, your head's down and you're still going into your building. Uh, whereas if you walk into Glide and you're there to volunteer or there to participate in some other way, uh, you kind of have to be with it. You have to be with the experience, in which case then you're also thinking and feeling the experience. And that's what we often cause people to do. So I have found that for many companies that have come, uh, they've ended up having very interesting dialogue once they've gone back to their office about their experience and what happened to them and what that means about their team. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a great question. I, I had, if you don't mind, I had one um, CEO come and meet with us. and. Uh, he's, I gave him a tour and we talked afterwards and he said, I'm amazed that this place works it as well as it does given all the things that are going on here and the variety of people that are here and the quote unquote chaos that seems to exist in terms of what's happening. And yet it runs really well. I don't understand how that can be possible. What did you answer him? I was very interested. Or her. I, I, I'm trying to think about what I did answer him at the time, but I, I think that the question itself was interesting that he noticed that. Uh, but certainly, I think sometimes we have a notion that for things to work, <clears throat> it needs to work in a particular way. People have to behave in a particular way. They have to do it in a certain way. And that's the only way that it can happen and work effectively. And I think at Glide, we challenge those assumptions. Uh, we can have a place that's extraordinarily diverse. We can allow people to really express themselves fully in an environment. Uh, we can hold the diversity of people that basically have very little and people that have more, people that don't have education, people that have ed education, people that come from different countries and different uh, ethnic backgrounds, and hold all of that and still also run really well. And I think that that's, it, it is interesting in terms of what that could mean if we all were a little more freed up in how we thought about how we led. I always think it's really interesting how the assumptions that are embedded in our, in our consciousness um, are challenged continually at Glide. That the ideas have to come from the people who uh, wear suits instead of the people who are uh, sitting there in uh, tattered clothing and may not have um, have a place to live uh, for now. That the roles that, that are embedded in our subconscious um, that are based on um, all sorts of, of fallacies, of, of impressions of, of uh, gender roles or, or, um, or age roles or, um, or socioeconomic roles, that all of those ideas that we all exist with, uh, they're, they're, they seem to be consistently challenged. And 
Glide seems to shake us up on a, on a pretty consistent basis and, and make us say, wait a second, that really is not true. Right. How do you manage an organization whose founding principle is unconditional love? Uh, it's a good question. Um, it's not easy. You have to say uh, the work that we do around uh, radical inclusivity and truth telling and people bringing themselves fully forward uh, is very hard work. Uh, it adds a whole other dimension to work besides the day to day, you know, the meetings and all of those other things and managing your budget and managing your infrastructure and managing your IT systems and all those things and managing your programs for your clients and dealing with the issues that inevitably come up. Uh, it's not easy to bolt onto that um, work that has to do with loving everyone and with the, uh, with the assumptions that, that, that the assumptions that that um, challenges. I think, you know, oftentimes, you know, we have to come back and we have to ask ourselves, um, is that really uh, the most loving way I could handle that? Um, when we're making decisions, we have to often look back at those decisions and really ask the question of whether that decision is consistent with our values. Is it really, is that really for the people? Is that decision really, it's one of our values for the people? Is that really that? Is that as inclusive as we can be? And when you want to create an environment that is inclusive, uh, it inevitably, in a sense, takes more time for the linkages to happen and to be made. Um, that being said, how that gets expressed in companies is people that misdirections or people or issues that come up that never got dealt with at the beginning and so it, it comes up and so, so this stuff bleeds out in some way or another. Um, but there, it is not easy to lead an organization that is continually um, discussing those things as a part of its regular day-to-day -day work. That being said, it's also wonderful work. Um, so I would say it does take more time. Um, it takes a great deal of openness. You know, I found that I've had to become a much more open person. Um, I've had to um, step back as a leader um, more um, than I might in other circumstances. Um, I've had to really challenge my own assumptions about how things need to be done and how things, you know, what's the right way to do something and recognize that way is not the way I might do it. Um, it's not even the way I would even think it should be done, um, but it worked. Is, is the approach to, to develop um, a, a consensus sufficient so that you reach a tipping point as opposed to um, this in, intense focus on leadership and top-down management? Because you don't, as a leader, allow action to be stymied by interminable, de interminable debate. But on the other hand, you give more license than you might otherwise uh, give. And, and out of that license come some very interesting ideas. How, how do you navigate there? How do you get to the point where, where, you, where you can actually take action as opposed to waiting for 100 people, 150 people to reach a consensus that everything's going to be, which, which of course never happens? Mm -hmm. I think leaders need to be clear about how they make decisions, and I've tried to do that with, with, this, with the team that reports to me. So to be clear that there are times when I'm seeking input, there are times when we're making a collective decision, and there are times when I'm just making the decision. And I think that's important um, for people to understand, because I think when you get mixed up in that, then people don't know, well, what is the intent behind that, and is, is, does my opinion really count? And so I've been clear in saying, there, we're going to sit in all of these times and to be very clear about that. Um, I also really am working hard at this point to create more of a shared leadership approach uh, with the senior team. I have, a, I have actually a wonderful group of people that work um, in the organization and work um, in leadership with me. And so I'm, I've really challenged them. I've chosen, particularly this year, to begin to challenge them to step up themselves more as leaders of the whole organization rather than as leaders of the areas where they're working. 
Um, and that is, um, is something that we are working towards. It's not easy. Uh, we have actually one, one, uh, one of our senior team meetings each month, not the entire meeting, but a part of the meeting we're simply devoting to process. How is this working? Um, we've also said that I, you know, I'm not the person where everything needs to come through. I'm not solving people's problems. Um, but people need to, if there are problems, that they get surfaced or they get dealt with so that people aren't holding on to the things that prevent us not being able to work together well as a team. So I don't, I'm not a person that believes uh, completely in a consensus model. I think it doesn't work. Uh, but I do believe there are many decisions that can be done through consensus. Um, and then there are others that just have to get made and you need input. And what I do tell all of my staff, not just my senior staff, but all of my staff, is if you see me making a decision that you know or believe is the wrong decision, then you are equally responsible for my mistake. Um, and that's true for everything that happens in the organization. So you're challenging people to challenge you. Absolutely, and to challenge other people in the organization. But you also seem to provide a context for that challenge. You, you, you say that you've, you've tried to, uh, perhaps in contrast to the way you operated previously, make your decision processes more transparent, your logic more transparent. So the challenge would also be a challenge to, the, to that logic and, and to your process. And so uh, I guess one of the things that you're doing is defining the terms uh, in which you would, you would like your decisions to be challenged. If you have a, a uh, logical fallacy or if, or if your approach is wrong or there are going to be some bad repercussions of some decisions, you'd like the, those specific issues to be brought to absolutely. you. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that I'm not the, I, I, I may be the CEO, but we're all responsible for Glide's success. All of us have a role to play in that. I can't tell you the number of times I have donors that what made the difference for them was how they were greeted at the door of the building. So every single person at Glide um, has a significant role to play in what happens. Um, and uh, and it's, not just, it's not just me. We all have a major role to play in that. Uh, I think also, you know, part of what's, uh, when you think about the issue of unconditional love, it also comes into play very much so in the issue of diversity. So if you have a, a staff that um, comes from different backgrounds of income or education, um, and you know that for some of your staff, they have gone light years in performance, um, but someone that might have come from a different background perhaps could have done more. How do you think about how you recognize that and how you reward that? Um, do you say that person's underperforming or they have done something extraordinary? So it raises many questions about how we lead. It raises many questions about the systems people put in place um, in organizations um, that oftentimes are also things that may uh, cause the status quo to continue to be maintained how and do, not, uh, not deal, enable diversity. How do you deal with that? If you, in a, in a, in a business context, it's, it's rather uh, straightforward and, and rather um, unemotional. You always choose, with very few exceptions, the person who objectively is going to drive you fastest, cheapest, best, um, but best always being defined as cheapest, fastest, um, in the direction that, that the chief executive has already defined. And if you can find somebody who can replace somebody else with 30 years of service who can do slightly more, then it's, it's, it's a reasonably automatic decision. Well, I think that um, I have been amazed at some of the gifts um, that we have at Glide through, from the perspective of wisdom um, that, can't, that can't be present in someone that's just begun to work or that's 30 years old at the point of their career. And so I think that balance of having, I mean, when you look at our organization, our average employee has been at Glide two to three years, which might surprise you because it feels like a place where people have been around for a long time. But our average employee is two to three years. 
but that's ba balanced by having people that have deep wisdom and deep presence in the organization. And some of that does come with age. Not always. I have some people that I would call very wise, who are wise and young. Uh, but some of that comes with age. So I think it's important to continually have that balance because they're gifts you might not experience or perceive. And also, I know that what's happening in our organization is we are very much engaged in a process of, of um, transfer of knowledge and of learning and of wisdom and of having, I think, a very um, thoughtful ways that we're doing that. So that in, in, in the roles that certain people are playing, we're really trying to build with them. Um, and that comes from time and experience. Um, and so I think, it's, I, think, I think both are really important. And that's what makes us so effective at the work that we do. It's not, uh, working at Glide is not just about did you get the meal done? Uh, did you get the person served? Um, did you get the child fed? Um, did you get the youth educated? That's part of our work. And what I have always said to our staff is if that's all we do, we have not succeeded. We have not succeeded as an organization. Um, really, our work is about, yes, doing all of those things. But it's just as much about how are we doing those things and what is the culture that we bring forth in accomplishing it. And we, are we doing it in a way that really um, enables us to bring our values fully forward. And our values are not easy, uh, but to bring them fully forward um, so that the work is being done in a way that also changes the world. Um, because our work is about transformation. It's not just about did the person have a meal, um, but it's also about the dignity they felt in the whole experience um, of their relationship to us. And so all of this is about the relationships that can be established and the dignity that can be shown to every single person that walks through the building. So if somebody gets served 15% uh, faster at a 22% at a lower cost um, with a 2% um, with a smaller headcount, but they go away feeling that they've been rushed through like a, like a piece of product on, a, on an assembly belt. Um, that would be a failure. Absolutely. We wouldn't have done anything to change the world. All we would have done is fed someone, which is important. That's all important. Um, but why do it that way when you can also create the opportunity for personal transformation and create the opportunity for real relationship building to occur and for joy? Uh, because one of the things I know that from many of the people that walk into the building, what they experience, despite all the poverty and the things that happen, is a real sense of, of um, warmth and of spirit. Um, and that's because of the way we do our work. 